Good morning. And sorry to disappoint you, but there will be no lecture. I'm here to uh, say a few words and then uh, perhaps open the floor uh, for Q and A's. From experience, I have learned uh, two things. Number one, I never walk into a place with remarks. So my team would always bother themselves with uh, preparing remarks, but I would never use them. Uh, and so you know, disappointment after disappointment, they stopped preparing remarks for me. Um, second thing is, uh, from experience as well, uh, it's always a better engagement when it's uh, both ways. So you have questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Let me tell you though, um, maybe a little bit about my background, uh, where I'm coming from, what I'm planning to do here in, um, in India. Uh, before that, let me share also a story uh, that my grandmother used to always tell me uh, as I was growing up. When when my grandmother talks about money, she doesn't use dirhams. She doesn't say dirhams. She doesn't say fils. Uh, she refers to the Indian currency. And the reason why she does that is because for the longest time in my country, we used to use the Indian currency. And so that's her terminology of expressing monetary value. And this is something that has stayed with me for quite some time. So when I came here and uh, I started using also the currency here, it, it's, it's quite familiar, right? You, you're used to it. You've been growing up hearing that terminology and, and so you're quite familiar with it. So back home, um, I've been in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for quite some time. And um, this is uh, my basically uh, disclaimer. Uh, I never thought I'd be posted anywhere. Um, for the longest time back home, I thought there was way too much work to be done. And every single time I got moved from one place to another, I've been moved from one place of crisis to another place of crisis. So uh, to, give you, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, before my role in the economic and trade affairs sector, I was in policy planning. At the time, uh, in policy planning, there was a crisis all over the Middle East. There was Iraq, Syria, the nuclear agreement with Iran, uh, the, Libya was uh, having its own issues and all kinds of problems were happening in the Middle East. And then I moved from policy planning to the economic and trade sector and we had to, to, ha we had to deal with monetary issues, uh, money laundry issues, uh, blacklisting here and intellectual property there and so on and so forth. And so when the foreign minister told me almost a year ago uh, that he's thinking of me to go to India, my first reaction was, why? And, and, and then he said, you know, because I need someone there who understands what we're trying to do in India. You come from an economic background, you've done food security, you have worked on the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, and so you seem to be uh, the right person to send at the right time. Now, my answer to him initially was just my first reaction, just to understand, so where did this come from? It's, it's, it's coming from nowhere. And then, you know, one conversation after another, it seemed like only uh, normal and natural for me uh, to come here because there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of interest uh, for my leadership in growing this relationship further and further and to make it not just individual, but also institutional. And at the same time, to leverage on all the opportunities that we can leverage on uh, by having individuals involved in this file who are keen on growing this relationship. So um, I came here last October and I arrived on uh, Diwali, uh, which was a pure coincidence. It was not planned. And uh, I've been having fun since then. You know, I, uh, I ran a marathon and uh, I tried street food and uh, I've been around uh, uh, to a, quite a few cities and states. And uh, it's been exciting. It's been very different uh, in comparison to what I have experienced in the past working in HQ. And now when uh, being here for almost four months and thinking back uh, to the conversation I had with the foreign minister a year ago, I don't think I would have chosen a better place. Uh, if, if they have asked me, uh, where should uh, we send you as an ambassador? I wouldn't have picked a better place to be rather than being here in India with everyone. Uh, and now being here, uh, and now being here, it just seems like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in that, I'm actually in that age group to, of the 900 million uh, Indians, which also makes, you know, more sense because uh, I can relate to, uh, to ideas, I can relate to, uh, 
a generation that, yes, I don't necessarily belong to it, but um, I'm close enough to understand where they come from, the grievances, what they're interested in, what they want to, to see happen. And uh, this is why what we're trying to do here is not just on the political and the economic level, but also on the cultural sports level and all kinds of things. This is why we want to have the paddle tennis courts here. Uh, when I went to present, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's, it's some sort of a, a hybrid sport between squash and, and tennis. And so one of my mandates uh, for my leadership is to introduce paddle tennis into India. It's here, but to expand it. So when I went to present my, uh, my plan uh, being here in India, they told me, no, not just paddle tennis now. You have to also introduce jiu-jitsu which I don't play, by the way. So, so, uh, so, so that's another thing that's been added uh, to what we want to do, introduce here and to do here. Just to give you an idea of what we're trying to, to expand in terms of the relationship. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, as the Vice Chancellor mentioned, I do teach also back home, and there is a plan for me to teach here, uh, a very short course, I think, a two-month course. Um, and... Let me tell you this in a very undiplomatic way. Uh, from my experience as well, students seem to be the best audience. And my best conversations are usually also with students because there's always this uh, intellectual curiosity, uh, you know, uh, debates and, and arguments back and forth and trying to figure things out. And this is something that I uh, miss from my time on campus when I was doing my PhD. Thank you again for having me. I'll keep it uh, short and simple and I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. My name is Aban Guptu. I am doing my BA in political science and I'm a third year. So um, India has in, um, invited the UAE as a special guest for the G20 summit this year. Um, how do you feel about this recent development? Um, well, this is the second year uh, in a row for the UAE to be a guest country. And before that, we were invited to the Saudi presidency as, uh, as the chair of the GCC. Uh, I'm not sure if this has been shared, but I'm, I'm also the UAE sous chef for the G20. So, so I have two capacities. I'm, I'm doing both. Uh, and this is quite exciting for us because it kind of puts us in the mode of being better prepared when we are invited to uh, such multilateral platforms of multilateral engagements. Uh, we have noticed over time being active in those uh, meetings have enabled us to be better organized internally, uh, to understand the different priorities that countries have and how we can help and support in bridging the gap between the different positions. Hi, uh, my name is Aryan. I'm a second year student of BA Global Affairs at JSI. Uh, my question is that considering the recent developments between Israel and Palestine, I just want your opinion to know whether you still think, you know, the two-state solution is viable for the region or not. The two-state solution is the only viable solution for the region. It's just uh, what would have changed over time is the way to get there and the fact that changes on the ground or changes in the conflict itself does not mean that it's going to undermine the two-state solution because that's the only solution moving forward. My name is Akrit and I'm in my final year of BA Global Affairs right here. My question is about the recent resolution that was passed on Ukraine in the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, we'd love to hear more about the UAE's perspective on the same and the rationale behind it. Thank you very much. Um, can you clarify, please? What do you mean by the UAE's rationale behind it? Um, the, U the UAE's rationale behind voting in favor or against the resolution. As a UAE, we always have... Um, the way we stand or our position is one of, of balance. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that uh, we are able to talk to different countries and different sides of conflicts, whether this conflict or any other conflict, and to be able to bring those positions closer and be able to navigate such, such situations. And so any rationale behind any position is uh, stemming from that. Excellency, my name is Yukti. I'm a final year student of MA in uh, Diplomacy, Law and Business. So my question is relating to uh, the uh, the grouping I do, you do, where in both India and UAE are members. So I wanted to ask your opinion on uh, what is your what is the rationale behind uh, the formation of this group and how was it uh, how has it been faring for UAE so far for this grouping that we have with Israel and United States as well. Thank you. So this is one uh, one aspect that we're working on, which is expanding the relationship beyond the multilateral multi the bilateral scheme. So. Uh, Bilateral relationship is going great. Uh, so you would see this happening. You would see also a trilateral cooperation with France involved. 
And in terms of the IT YouTube uh, as a platform and the recently uh, held IT YouTube business forum, there are quite a few projects that we are working on uh, in India and elsewhere. One of them is the food parks uh, project in, in, in Gujarat as an example to many other projects that we're going to work on in the future. I am Nikita, I'm a final year political science student. What I wanted to ask was that India and UAE in May of 2022 signed the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. So how do you think this agreement has been faring in the past few months specifically? Thank you. It was signed in February, by the way, so this month, and it was fully implemented from May uh, 2022. Uh, it's, it's going well so far. Uh, we are at 44 billion US dollars non oil trade. The target is 100 billion US dollars by 2027. Uh, and this is part of the uh, reason why we have been doing business roundtables, not only in Delhi, but also in other states, uh, to raise awareness about what uh, SEPA offers in terms of benefits for businesses who are based here or businesses who are based in UAE. Yeah, Veselin Popovsky, professor in the law school here. You know, usually ambassadors talk about how much GDP growth they had in the last year and other economic statistics, but you made our students feel very nicely today. My question is about the climate change uh, conference of the parties, which your government very kindly agreed to host in November this year. And, uh, you know, recently we see uh, a lot of reports suggesting that more action need to be taken in terms of addressing climate change and the many negative effects of the climate change. There are a lot of extreme weather events, floodings, uh, fires. So I wonder what your government is planning and what expectations do you have from the Conference of the Parties in November? Thank you. If, uh, since you said that we kindly agreed to host it, just just, for you, just to clarify this point, there was some lobbying to be done, right? Uh, and here is a fun story for everyone. Um, I was entrusted to speak to one of those countries that were supposed to vote. And uh, because of the time difference, I had to make the call at, I think, 7 a.m. UAE time. And so I spoke to the minister and I told her, uh, you know, we, we are uh, eager to host the uh, COP28 and uh, we'd like to have your country's support and your vote. And she's like, uh, so who else is uh, running against you? I told her, and then she's like, yeah, but you know what? They didn't call us. You called us first. You called us first, so you get our vote. <laughs> um, on on the COP28, uh, I believe we stand uh, in a very unique position uh, because we do not fit into one category or one group versus the other, and so we are very well positioned to bridge the current gap between uh, countries that want to industrialize and develop further uh, without having to restrict themselves in comparison to countries that have already industrialized and have contributed to carbon emissions. Uh, and so I think this is, this is the, the, the main debate that's going to be there. And the UAE stands uh, in a place where it can actually navigate such turbulence and, and help in uh, supporting countries with their national goals of, of cutting carbon emissions, so on and so forth. We know Rajamani, professor of diplomatic practice, general law school. Ambassador, you talked about being in the middle and trying to help resolve issues wherever you can. UAE as a small but a highly dynamic country with a visionary leadership is capable of intervening and trying to help find solutions in many disputes across the world. Your colleague in Washington some time back had talked about UAE playing a role in mediating the ceasefire between India and Pakistan. Can you share your thoughts, or thoughts on what role UAE can play in resolving the issues between India and Pakistan? Well, as a country, we don't have issues with other countries. And, and this is why I was referring to the UAE's position as a position that can always bridge the gap in positions, can always bring uh, the conversation back to the table and always be able to negotiate the way forward. I think this is the way uh, that the UAE would continue to carry itself in the future, whether uh, it is uh, in this specific case or any other case. Jitendranath Mistra, Professor of Diplomatic Practice, Jin School of International Affairs. Ambassador, congratulations on the AMAL probe that you sent so successfully some time back. What is the prospect of cooperation in space between India and the UAE? So there's, there's a conversation that's happening. It's one of the uh, priority fields that we have identified between the two countries that we'd like to expand on. Uh, it's still 
uh, let's say at the technical level conversation, just like other industries that also are reliant and dependent on a lot of research. Uh, but once there are obviously some developments, you will also get to hear about them. Ambassador, I have a question which uh, I, I think several uh, maybe students and faculty might uh, may be wanting to ask as well. Um, for many of us who are in India, uh, when we look at Middle East and that part of the world, there is a certain degree of predictable uh, thinking in terms of they all similarly situated countries. My question to you is that if you look at UAE and juxtapose it with the other countries in the region, what is many ways unique about UAE? And equally important question I would say is that in the last decade or so, how do you see the society has transitioned and transformed? And I ask that question because one of the things economic development does is it challenges social norms inevitably. And it is so difficult to maintain any form of social norm while high levels of economic development is happening. And we have seen that in India from 1990s to even now. So how does UAE society balance the economic development on the one hand and let's say social and community norms on the other? Okay, so maybe answering this in, uh, in two parts. Uh, we're very agile, we're very progressive, we're very dynamic as a country and as a government. And you can see this uh, not only at the highest level of government, but also at all the other levels in government. Uh, if you are paying attention to the uh, legislations and regulations uh, in the UAE, you would notice that in the past three to five years, especially during COVID and post-COVID, we have had many changes uh, to all kinds of laws and regulations. Uh, that's maybe our, even more than any other law change that have happened in any other country around us. And um, again, this, if anything, this is just a testament to the fact that, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are ahead of the game. Um, it's okay to have uh, competition. Uh, it's okay to, uh, you know, grow similar sectors to, what are, to the sectors that are present in other countries. But the matter of fact is, how can you do it different and make it uh, interesting and exciting for individuals to come and reside in the UAE and to do business in the UAE and make it easier for them to do so? On the social part, uh, maybe maybe the best example to use here is, is is my own son. So for those of you who don't know, I have I have twins, uh, a boy and a girl. They're five years old. And before I told them that I was coming to India, my son picked up uh, from his friend in school how to ask what's your name in Hindi mm -hmm. and it was fascinating at the time because yes I knew that I was coming to India he did not know that I was coming to India and uh, I thought you know what a sign uh, uh, of, of things to come and then uh, how interesting that he picked this up from school mm -hmm. and if you look at any uh, population in the way you small or, or big, whether we're talking about uh, a population in school or whether we're talking about the wider population, the UAE, the UAE's population is international. Yeah. And 30% of uh, non-UAE uh, citizens are from India. So it's only normal that the society has grown accustomed to uh, this kind of balance between you know, social norms and uh, growing the economy, being able to be progressive, changing the laws, not only to accommodate Emiratis, but also to accommodate everyone else who's living, on, uh, living in the UAE. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency. I really enjoyed your opening statement. Uh, so I have two questions, if that's okay. One is very light, one is kind of heavy. So the first is you said in your uh, introductory statement that you tried Indian street food. What was your favorite Indian street food, if I may ask? <laughs> and the second is that India and UA recently uh, tried to partnership in terms of climate change developments and climate change mitigation development in economic terms as well. So what do you think will be India and UAE be doing together for climate change mitigation in the, la in the uh, coming 10 years, uh, say? Uh, so I would like to really have your insight since you are coming from a young and dynamic background and we also are interested in that. So thank you so much. Uh, so the first, the first answer is uh, Shai Tukwa. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, 
And, 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 and the, reason, the reason I'm saying this is because every single Indian restaurant offers you the usual, Ras Malai, Gulab Jamun, and so on. Uh, but to me, this is my favorite. Uh, I don't even understand why we don't have it back in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So it's, 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 a bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit strange. Yes, but, but it, was, it was good enough that they had, I think, two or three portions of it the other day. Uh, uh, so, so anyways, so that's to answer the first question. The uh, second uh, question is, uh, we're trying to find uh, common uh, themes to work on between the uh, India's uh, between India's presidency of the G20 and our upcoming presidency of COP28. Uh, India is part of our uh, mangrove uh, alliance, uh, and this is probably a clear illustration of what we're trying to do together and uh, moving forward. The other thing is uh, to see how uh, we can grow the areas of cooperation between the two files. Uh, making sure that anything that is uh, agreed on or achieved, uh, whether it's uh, on the G20 level or the COP28 level, can be implemented and carried forward in the future. Uh, the UAE is, uh, is an investor in uh, India's uh, renewable energy sector, and we'll continue to invest in the renewable sector in, in India moving forward to help India achieve its 2030 targets. I'm a second year student. My name is Rajoshi. I'm a second year student in Masters in Indian School of International Affairs, where we are eagerly waiting to have you teachers um, and um, your excellency you can have more of shahi tukras i just saw your push up videos with milin soman so you are doing perfectly fine um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you can afford it yeah <laughs> um, excellency i also read up a bit on your profile that says you teach geopolitics of food security and your interest include fishing uh, a 2022 study found a staggering 75 percent of dead turtles in the shores of sharjah having eaten marine debris, particularly plastic waste. So my question, and there's also overfishing like throughout the world. So my question is, what is the UAE doing to stop marine pollution and clean up the ocean? And also uh, with the question relating to pollution, um, this image of cities in UAE having these ultra luxury lifestyles with cooling systems, with like people using this ultra luxury SUVs, limousines. How difficult do you think is to convince people to adopt this electric vehicles and and, and shift from these fuel guzzlers and emitters, SUVs and limousines. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start by myself. So I just uh, bought an electric car back home, and uh, we are acquiring. Uh, we have acquired two electric cars coming into the embassy. So we are also replacing our fleet. Uh, I think that kind of answers the question of uh, how this can be changed. The other thing that happened in the UAE uh, in the past. Uh, five plus years is that the fuel subsidy has been removed. So now uh, the price that you pay at the pump is basically market price, which means that it's not as cheap as it used to be, which means that you will have to consider other options. And so this is why you can see that there are uh, many more electric cars being driven around uh, in the way compared to what you would see 10 years ago. Uh, stations have been, uh, power stations are being uh, built everywhere. So you find them uh, fixed in. Uh, Settlement uh, apartments, people are doing them in their houses. Uh, it's, it's becoming easier basically to do that so that you can easily charge your car if you drive an electric car. In terms of uh, pollution, we are doing our bit in terms of cleaning uh, our part of uh, our part of the uh, our part of the uh, It's an ongoing process. There is no uh, straightforward <coughs> uh, solution. Having mangroves and planting mangroves helps in certain aspects, uh, particularly carbon emissions. Uh, stabilizing the source and so on, uh, but there's still a lot more to do there. Uh, Ambassador, uh, I have a specific question. We know that UAE uh, is distinct from the other countries uh, to a great extent, and right from the beginning. That is, UAE is far more religiously tolerant. Uh, people may or may not know this, that one of the largest temples outside of India, and newest temples, is in the UAE. Tomorrow, uh, it will be open to the public, a house of Abraham. That is in the same complex, you will have a synagogue, a church, and a masjid. So uh, UAE is very important for India, as I said, because you know millions of Indians live there. Their remittances, their security, their health, their well-being is important to us. UAE is very important to us because of our trade relationship, our oil imports, our exports of manufactured goods. Um, UAE is an entreport. Uh, so many Indians go to Dubai for entertainment, 
to, for shopping, etc. But most Indians are not aware of UAE's special status for India. Most Indians don't know. They think of UAE in the same light as they think of, say, Qatar or, you know, uh, Bahrain or uh, the countries around. But actually, UAE's position is unique for India and is of great importance. So what is the embassy, what is the government of UAE doing to emphasize the UAE's importance to India? Doing uh, 20 push-ups after a marathon <laughs> and uh, visiting states. Uh, but no, the, truly, uh, it's engaging with everyone because uh, obviously you can have your meetings with government officials and you can uh, you know, attend all kinds of receptions. Uh, yesterday, someone at the reception mista has mistaken me for a diplomat from another Gulf country. Uh, but you know, the matter of fact is uh, we could see it on the different levels in society and not just in government. And uh, the other thing that we saw uh, quite recently as well is that when I hosted the National Day uh, reception, uh, we had more than 90, more than 100, 102 countries uh, attend the reception uh, between ambassador and charge the affairs which is the highest number in any reception in India. And so you could see that, you know, th this is uh, what's happening. And this could not have happened if people do not understand uh, uh, where, where the UAE stands uh, to uh, India and where the India stands to the UAE. I was uh, in uh, Jeffu Literature Festival and uh, I was stopped by a man uh, who asked for a picture. So we took the picture and then he told me, my brother works in the UAE. And I asked him where, and he said in Diba, and Muhammad he was from from Diba. And so, so you know, it's it's. I don't think this is something that uh, people don't know. It's just something that maybe uh, we just need to capitalize on further and further, uh, and that could be done by having those different engagements, not only the uh, political and economic ones. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ravida. Ambassador, multilateralism is on the decline and uh, UA is a very active participant, as you said. I see two aspects right now in the global arena besides the climate change. One is the peace architecture. The UN uh, definitely stands eroded in two because of the Russia-Ukraine war. And second, of course, is a more chronic issue, which is the international monetary and financial architecture, which G20 is also trying to address the differences between the global north and the global south. Would you like to share some perspectives on both aspects? Thank you. I think we kind of touched upon uh, some of this in the previous uh, answers. Um, us being the G20 gives us the chance to represent or present countries that are naturally underrepresented in those uh, multilateral platforms. And we say this very clearly. So when, when we come to the table, we have already consulted or spoken to underdeveloping, developing countries, understood their positions, uh, what they're trying to achieve. And we try to be their voice in those uh, platforms to make sure that the priorities that are being agreed on are not only priorities that work for a few, but priorities that work for the majority. And being the UAE, uh, we stand where we stand, uh, and given our positions on different uh, issues and files, we actually do not come with an agenda and we do not come uh, as a country that people might suspect. Uh, we come as a country that could present balancing views and uh, be able to bridge the gap between the positions. It's an ongoing conversation. Uh, we have been part of that conversation, uh, especially being in the Security Council as a non-permanent uh, member. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it's still an ongoing process. Uh, and it's an ongoing conversation. Great. Let's get more questions. Yeah, please. Uh, I'm Yudhishthir and I'm in my final year, BA Global Affairs. So my question is, a year ago, uh, there was a terrorist attack, a uh, cross-border terrorist attack on the soil of UAE. So what steps have been taken to avoid further terrorist attack and what on what level UA is cooperating with India on that front as India long has been uh, a victim of cross-border terrorism? So India was uh, a main country that supported us uh, after the attacks. 
and which we highly appreciate. Uh, and what I can tell you today is the UAE after the attacks is not the same UAE before the attacks. We have changed our priorities. We have changed our uh, focus. We have changed the kind of attention that we pay to countries. And that was uh, quite frankly based on those incidents and how countries reacted to those incidents with relation to the UAE. This is what has changed. We've been uh, obviously now paying even closer attention to our defense sector, uh, our research uh, capacity and capabilities, and on expanding ties uh, with countries that have come to our support and to our aid uh, versus other countries.